Hey YouTubers, this is the Gold Standard Season 924 coming at you with my review of the 2017 WWE SummerSlam pay-per-view event. And I'll be honest, I was just very disappointed with this pay-per-view overall. Especially with the first hour of the main card overall. I believe the crowd was completely burnt out from the kickoff matches that were consisting of two championship matches. One of them being the Cruiserweight title bout between... Adrian Neville and Akira Tozawa, as well as the SmackDown tag title bout between the New Day taking on the Usos. And you could really tell, especially when you watch the actual card for SummerSlam, when you get to the main show, it's like the crowd just kind of didn't seem to have as much reaction compared to those two championship matches that were on the pre-show and it, I de it definitely really tells especially from the first match on the SummerSlam card which was John Cena taking on Baron Corbin now it was very surprising for John Cena especially given his especially given his star power in the WWE over the years when you think of John Cena being on SummerSlam, you would expect a potential marquee match. Now, fast forward from the previous year where he fought against AJ Styles. And now, 2017, he's opening up the show, which is quite ironic. I mean, you gotta do what you gotta do in order to get the crowd somewhat pumped. But, yeah, this was surprisingly John Cena opening up a show, which we haven't seen quite I think this is the first time that John Cena opened up a pay-per-view but correct me if I'm wrong there but he ended up facing Baron Corbin basically Baron Corbin how this feud stems from the go home Smackdown to SummerSlam basically Cena was in a match with Jinder Mahal Baron Corbin came out there to cash in his money in the bank that he won earlier this year John Cena ended up interfering and costing Baron Corbin the chance to win the title belt. So Jinder Mahal ended up retaining the WWE title with the roll-up, much to the chagrin of Baron Corbin. So that kind of intensifies into having this match at SummerSlam. Now, Baron could have had a chance, especially even with the way that he was portrayed going into that uh, when he was cashing in money in the bank, it's like, man, his plan just kind of backfired for a moment there. Like, maybe Baron could have at least had another chance to redeem himself by defeating the guy that cost him the opportunity to even win the WWE Championship. But, yeah, this match only lasted about 10 minutes, which was kind of shocking for... A pay-per-view match with John Cena because you would expect Cena to you know pull out all the stops and just consisting of a lot of drama and suspense a lot of near falls but you didn't really kind of get that with John Cena this time around. Cena ended up going over Baron Corbin in a pretty short match and it was kind of disappointing especially with Baron Corbin just losing his money in the bank briefcase and now he's come up short against John Cena it's like where does he go from here it's like what do you do with Baron going forward I mean but I mean this you know, Baron Corbin came in on the main roster just about a year ago won Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal he like I said won the money in the bank briefcase earlier this year and now he's just kind of going through a downward spiral. But I, I honestly kind of felt that this match was pretty disappointing. Didn't really do Baron Corbin any favors, especially with the loss. I, I would think maybe John Cena is going to go after the WWE title at this rate. But we'll just have to wait and see. Next up we have is the SmackDown Women's Championship. Naomi going in as the champion, taking on the challenger Natalia. Natalia ended up winning the Fatal 5-Way match at Battleground to determine the number one contender for the SmackDown Women's title. Now this match wasn't bad by any means, but 
it just kind of really felt like nothing like out of this world per se. Natalia hadn't really been winning championship belts for about six years. So whenever Natalia is contending for a woman's title, nine times out of ten, she ends up coming up short or there's some kind of screwy finish. And Naomi's have held that SmackDown Women's title belt for quite some time. I would expect like Naomi to take on Charlotte at the time that Battleground took place because Naomi and Charlotte didn't have a rematch of sorts because like earlier earlier this year they had a match ended in a no contest and they never really followed through with another rematch to determine a clear winner. So I would have figured going into it instead that Charlotte was going to win that number one contenders match to challenge Naomi with the possibility of Carmella cashing in her money in the bank. I mean, this match was kind of like a TV style match you would see on SmackDown. Natalia did make some remarks on Naomi and the championship belt design that Naomi kind of fiddled around with. Natalia ended up going over Naomi with the sharpshooter allowing her to tap out and for Na uh, Natalia to walk out of the match as the new SmackDown Women's Champion. So congrats to Natalia. She hasn't held that belt for six years, hard to believe. Like, you wouldn't see Carmella come out there to potentially cash in her briefcase. I mean, there was just no surprises overall. Like I said, Natalia ended up winning the match. She's now the SmackDown Women's Champion. Now we get to the third match, which wasn't really a match, more of a kind of like a squash, a blink and you missed it kind of match. And that was Randy Orton taking on Rusev. Basically, there wasn't really a lot of buildup, but there was a bit of a brawl that was going on at ringside. And as soon as the bell rang, Randy Orton immediately hits Rusev with the RKO and wins the match in such short amount of time. Now with Rusev, it's just a shame just to see just how much he's fallen over the years. Ever since he came up on the main roster, he was just demolishing wrestlers left and right, going through like this undefeated streak, winning the United States title. And he was undefeated for about a year up until John Cena, his program with him, and ended up and Cena ended up dethroning Rusev, doing the unthinkable in order to win the United States title. Yeah, I mean, ever since Rusev ended up losing to John Cena, it's like, he just hasn't really been the same since. It was, I think Rusev just really needs to get kind of get that groove back, but it's going to take a long time if he wants to, you know, regain that sort of glory that he once had when he first debuted in the WWE. Randy Orton, this is just basically to get him on the card. He's their top tier guy for the past 15 years or so. Now we get to the Raw Women's Championship bout. This was Alexa Bliss taking on Sasha Banks. Now originally this was going to be Alexa Bliss taking on Bayley, but Bayley suffered a shoulder injury during her match against Nia Jax. So they had to go through yet another qualifying series of matches to determine the substitute number one contender. And Sasha Banks ended up winning the number one contender's bout to challenge Alexa Bliss for the title. Now this match was fine the way it was. I would think this match would have been a lot better if this was a Falls Count Anywhere match considering the finish that they had at Battle... Uh, not Battleground, but at great balls of fire i can't believe i even said that name um as shitty of a name as that pay-per-view was anyway basically sasha banks won by count out just based on the scenario between the two competitors you would think they could have at least raised the stakes a little higher rather just than just throwing it out to just be a simple traditional one-on-one -on -one grudge match between the two I don't know. I mean, that's WWE for you. <laughs> Nevertheless, Sasha Banks ended up making Alexa Bliss tap with the bank statement, allowing Sasha to walk out as the new Raw Women's Champion. Now, I be I want to think that Bailey's as soon as she recovers, would be the first in line to challenge Sasha for the Raw Women's title. 
possibly a heel turn, although I can't get my hopes up considering, you know, with Bailey and her situation that's going on with the way that they've been booking her, it's got to the point where the crowd has completely turned on her. And, you know, I just kind of really feel bad for Bailey. I honestly don't think she deserves that much hate. But even though her promos could use a little work, I mean, the way that they've been kind of portraying her isn't really doing WB any favors as far as baby faces are concerned. The Rawls women's division, I've likely said this time and time again, probably is always it's, it's very thin at this point in terms of baby faces and heels and as much star power as you could possibly have. I mean, you have Mickey James on there, but she's just kind of there, really. She isn't necessarily playing a huge part in the division like she did in her first WWE run. They could, I, they probably should have kept her on SmackDown. I mean, when she first came back earlier this year, I mean, the crowd just went crazy, and her partnership with Alexa Bliss, and you know, they brought their, they brought them over the Raw, but instead they had Mickey James break away from Alexa despite being on the same brand, had her as a baby face. So that's not going anywhere, and she just kind of became an afterthought. The women's division just really needs a lot more of something. I know they're doing the Mae Young Classic, which I haven't really been following up if they had already started it. Well, it's what it is. Hopefully, I like to be <laughs> try to be as optimistic, but maybe not too overly optimistic about the state of the women's division per se but hopefully Sasha Banks gets a long title reign for once I mean with all these Bane switch title reigns that Sasha Banks has had since beating with Charlotte uh, hopefully that Sasha Banks at least gets a proper run with the belt and not just lose it as soon as she wanted I can't remember the last time she got one kind of looking forward to what's going to happen when she might potentially face Bailey at the next Raw pay-per-view, whenever that is. Now we have is the Demon King, Finn Balor, under his Demon King persona, taking on Bray Wyatt in a rematch that they had on Raw. This match wasn't necessarily that bad, but I mean, it's cool to see Finn Balor with that face paint. I mean, I think that's kind of the thing that makes him stand out. But unfortunately, it's only a pay-per-view exclusive for Finn Balor to come out with the Demon King face paint. I think that makes him more interesting than his actual appearance. I mean, this match wasn't bad, but it wasn't like anything out of this world. Finn Balor ended up getting his win back against Bray Wyatt. I mean, Bray Wyatt's just kind of doing the same stuff he's been doing for years, and it just doesn't seem to kind of change it up a bit. I mean, Finn Balor ended up going over Bray Wyatt. Just, well, it's not necessarily a bad match, but just kind of very forgettable. I mean, then again, I guess it did his job in allowing Finn Balor to, you know, finally get a pay-per-view victory here. Now we get is perhaps the best match of the night, and this was the Raw Tag Team title belts up for grabs. Cesaro and Sheamus defending the belts against two-thirds of the Shield with Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins. This match, just holy shit. I mean, the build-up was perhaps one of the few good things that WWE has done in recent years, especially with the way that they've been kind of trying to get Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins to be back in cahoots once again, but also bringing up some of their bad blood, their animosity towards one another when Seth Rollins ended up turning on Dean Ambrose and Roman Reigns having a series of matches that just kind of got to the point where these two wrestlers just were tearing each other apart and now you go from that fast forward three years later you know it's just kind of like holy shit man I really want to see them th get back together you know they but also acknowledging some past history and i believe they uh they managed to execute this really well i mean the crowd really went wild on raw when they did that signature fist that they did when they were in the shield definitely really paid off here 
Now, Ambrose and Rollins ended up winning the Raw Tag Team title belts, which I'm very glad. Uh, I think it's, the situation really called it, but it's definitely great to see Dean and Seth holding those tag team title belts, being on good terms. Now all that's left is Roman Reigns to you know side with the Shield, and we would have a full Shield reunion overall. I don't know, based on the direction that Roman Reigns has been going through and the way that the crowd has completely turned on him, especially, but a Shield reunion is definitely inevitable, especially a full Shield reunion. I mean, we saw like a sneak preview of that this past November, but as far as like a, an actual Shield reunion match, I mean, I definitely look forward to that. I think they'd actually, you know, actually they did one like two years ago. I still think it would, regardless, it would still be like something that people would be looking forward to overall. I'm definitely glad that uh, Dean and Seth ended up winning those tag team, tag team title belts. So it'll be interesting to see uh, who they will face going forward. They'll probably have a rematch between Cesaro and Sheamus. Wouldn't surprise me. I mean, how thin the tag team division is. I definitely think that was really cool, just to, you know, especially with this match and you know Seth and Dean walking out as your new Raw Tag Team Champions. Now we get to the United States Championship bout with the special guest referee Shane McMahon, Kevin Owens taking on AJ Styles. Now this was this was this was a match I really enjoyed. Now the only flaw that I have is just in terms of Shane McMahon's involvement and the amount of times that he kept getting knocked out, which got kind of got pretty repetitive after a while. Uh, but yeah, this match was still really cool with some back and forth near falls. And there were some s situations where it feels like, you know, based on the animosity between Kevin and Shane, AJ and Shane, just kind of going at it at each other and even with the fact that every time it seemed like they're trying to badmouth Shane McMahon it's like there's always these roll up finishes where it looked like that match is going to be over but then each competitor kept kicking out AJ Styles you know ended up winning that match he I thought he was going to win with this phenomenal splash or uh, phenomenal forearm excuse me he ended up winning that match and I think they, they were kind of flip-flopping the belts all around. So I can't really remember who was the champion going into it. AJ Styles did win the match. He's the United States champion. I believe they're going to do something with Kevin and Shane McMahon somewhere down the road. Maybe a potential match at the next pay-per-view. Or maybe at the start of a slow build-up to a feud at WrestleMania. But that would probably be a little too far-fetched. It'll be interesting to see, you know, Kevin Owens and Shane McMahon see what they would do between those two from here on out. Now we get to the WWE Championship. Jinder Mahal going in as the champion, taking on Shinsuke Nakamura. Shinsuke won a number one contenders match against John Cena. And forcing the challenge to Jinder Mahal for the WWE title. And this is a very interesting scenario. Last year's SummerSlam, they weren't even on the card. And fast forward now, it's like, what the hell? How did we get here, you know? I mean, these two guys who weren't even on last year's SummerSlam. I mean, Shinsuke was at NXT. Jinder Mahal was basically enhancement talent. So he wasn't even on the show and didn't have the credibility at that point. Jinder Mahal, who's been WWE Champion for about a couple months at this point. He won it from Randy Orton. He successfully went over in that Pachumi prison match at, a, at Battleground. Now, I'm still pretty sour with Jinder Mahal's title reign. And that's just one of the reasons why I kind of stopped watching SmackDown. Or not necessarily stopped watching. I mean, I kind of tune in here and there. But it's just not like a show that I really have to go my way out and see it i'll just probably watch like bits and bits of it but you know it's just not really catching on for me with, as far as his title reigns concerned he was just been jobbing for the past several years and all of a sudden he's just 
all the way up to main event status right out of the blue. And, you know, Shinsuke, I can't really say much since I haven't really watched a whole lot of NXT, but he ended up coming over to the main roster, especially during that Superstar shakeup, where they moved him over from there to SmackDown. You know, very interesting, because I believe this is the first time, especially in WWE, that they had a Japanese wrestler going after the top-tier belt, especially on pay-per-view. I mean, this is just about as diverse as you can get with the WWE. And Jinder Mahal ended up going over Shinsuke in not a very long match. I mean, I pretty much knew that Jinder was going to win. I would have liked to have seen Shinsuke or anyone take the belt out of Jim, off of Jinder Mahal, but I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. I mean, this match wasn't really anything exciting. I mean, just like last year with Dean Ambrose and Dolph Ziggler, I mean, this... WWE title match this year is just about as just as disappointing. Now we have is the main event, which is a fatal four-way match for the Universal Championship. Brock Lesnar defending the belt against Braun Strowman, Roman Reigns, and Samoa Joe. If Brock Lesnar loses, he will leave the WWE. Now this was a very fun match. I mean, this was the match that I was looking forward to the most. I mean. You know, Braun Strowman, I mean, just over a year ago, since he broke away from the Wyatt family, he's just kind of made a name for himself. Definitely got really over once at the Royal Rumble when he cost Roman Reigns the Universal title bout, which got him, like, that kind of sparked a lot of attention with the fans. And they've had a series of matches, despite an injury along the way, but... They had that ambulance match, which Strowman ended up going over Roman Reigns, giving him that energy boost that he needed to qualify for a universal title match. Uh, Samoa Joe, who debuted earlier this year, he's kind of been on a tear as well. He had a match at uh, Great Balls of Fire against Brock Lesnar, and Brock ended up demolishing him. So... All these feuds that are kind of going on were intertwined. Two matches, two feuds combined into one fatal four-way match, which really was, on paper, was going to be like this feel-good, big fight feel that you would get for a pay-per-view. Now, Braun Strowman, who was the MVP of this match, no doubt, he went for a running power slam on the Brock Lesnar through the announce table. And the crowd was just singing the na 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 hey hey goodbye to Brock Lesnar. It was pretty obvious that Brock Lesnar was going to like pop out of the stretcher and come back and finish off the match. It was just such a slugfest. I mean the crowd was eating up into it. I mean there were some really cool spots with the barricade with Roman Reigns doing the spear. Um... You know, just Braun Strowman just being the MVP of this match. Just, he played a huge part in this match. I mean, Samoa Joe, it's just kind of very hard considering that he was, he didn't really do anything like significant or anything noteworthy in the match. Um, you know, Roman Reigns was kind of Roman Reigns as usual, making it seem like he's going to win the match, but somehow, some way, it just kind of ends up backfiring. Like there's some, uh, you know, Roman Reigns going for a spear. Look like he's going to win the match. Someone breaks the count. He pinned Roman Reigns with the F5 in order to retain the universal title. So this is definitely a really great match. I mean, definitely better than Lesnar's last year against Randy Orton, which ended in a very anticlimactic finish. You know, with Samoa Joe's minor role in this match was probably kind of a bit of a the only con I could give as far as the fatal four way match is concerned. You know, Roman Reigns, I mean he's been surprisingly losing a lot of pay per view matches. I mean, granted he did beat The Undertaker and retiring him earlier this year at WrestleMania. But other than that, he hadn't really had any like pay per view victories for the most part this year. But I know there might be some speculation that Roman Reigns might face Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania, considering that Brock's going to be on his way out. 
which is kind of giving some fans some pretty much a lot of concerns concerning about the WrestleMania main event. Nothing's for sure. Nothing's set in stone officially, but we could only speculate, like I said. But, I mean, this Fatal 4-Way match was, you know, just really intense. But even despite Brock Lesnar just being overcoming the odds, I mean, I know people complain about John Cena overcoming the odds over the years, but, you know, Brock Lesnar just wasn't really that any different from Cena. So Lesnar ended up, you know, despite getting stretched out, the arena ends up coming back like it's nothing. F5, Roman Reigns, gets the victory. And that's how SummerSlam ends, basically. So let me know what your thoughts are considering about this year's SummerSlam event. What were some of your favorite matches? Least favorite matches? Let me know down in the comment section below. Until then, thank you all guys for watching. This is the Gold Standards User924 signing out.